Hello everyone. I'm having PC issues, and I think Windows is to blame for it. Um, it because it had a massive update. It wouldn't be surprised if it is Windows. It it's known for screwing things up. But um, anyways, I want to focus on a recording of how games can do better in terms of being educational, or just creating a good story. This will be based on my knowledge of studying history, as well as keeping up with current technologies. Let's get started with the U.S. military, as I think this is probably going to be a really good example of story before we get into what's on my screen. Over the course of history, there have been times where a U.S. military general will recommend a piece of equipment or firearm. In some of those cases, there has been times where that U.S. general has a claim or stake in the company that the equipment or firearm is being purchased from. The way they keep it quote-unquote ethical is they won't directly implicate themselves during those transactions. What they'll do instead is the company will say, hey, I recognize you. Let me give you a better deal than the other companies. In that scenario, they're saying, well, we recognize that you own us or have a stake with us, and we're going to do something nice for you. And because we want our um, equipment or firearms on the front page of military news. It's really scummy, but unfortunately, that's just the way the U.S. military works. It's not like um, Germany's military, where the courts are involved, and we'll get into that in a moment. But that's scenario one. Let's look at scenario two. Scenario two is where the tax, uh, or I mean, not the tax, the, uh, the people who handle the payroll or decisions back in Washington uh, will impose a purchase when the military doesn't need it, like we saw with the Abrams recently. Let's look at scenario three now. Scenario three is where we have a mix of the two going on, in which the general is telling the higher-ups that we should do this because of this reason and all this, when in reality they're just hiding the truth that they're really wanting this better deal because it's something to do with their company. It's actually why you don't see better, better body armor in the military. I will point that out. It's because of all those damn deals going on. Politics plays way too much of a factor in the U.S. military. While the U.S. military may have tons of experience and years of knowledge at their fingertips, they're not using it properly. This is a complete different scenario from, say, Germany's military, in which, as I mentioned, the courts are involved. If you look at the history of the G36 assault rifle, you will find that the military tried to get rid of it because it was overheating. The court stepped in and said, well, basically, we still have a contract with this, so we can't terminate that contract. You're stuck with the G36. It's a dual-edged sword. On face value, it sucks that they have to deal with an overheating weapon. But at the same time, it goes to show that the courts will protect the military should something happen in terms of politics, right? Let's just say the German military decides to buy a weapon that is absolutely phenomenal, like the HK-416, for example. Well, the courts can protect that from the higher-ups. If the higher-ups try to terminate that contract, the courts can tell them no, more than likely. So um, I think that the U.S. military needs to learn from the other countries. Now, that can be a story in itself. If you create a, like a real-time strategy game, right, you could get like a random event that says you earned or saved uh, X amount of dollars for buying from this company because your general had a stake in it. That's something you could totally do. I don't agree with making it a widespread thing, but I understand that it's part of history, and unfortunately the U.S. continues to make those mistakes. Therefore, they've fallen into that pit. 
But um, that's just one example of a story. Now let's go into some game examples to show you where stories are, and then we'll get into future discussions. So I've had Planetside up for the longest time because I think that this is one of a few good examples of um, game story. So the short version is Vanya Sovereignty believes in using alien technologies, and for that reason they use laser weapons, or plasma or particle weapons, whatever you want to use for that terminology. Terran Republic is still using older ballistics, and New Conglomerate, from what I've been able to tell in Planetside 1 from playing it, is they're using GOSS technologies. So, you can see where that they, they've made a really good story between the three factions, right? You've got somebody that's trying to use the latest, and you've got somebody who's using old and reliable, right? Let's look at another example. This is Act of War. This was a not so popular real-time strategy way back in the day, um, but it was a lot of fun. So in this one, you'll notice that they actually have U.S. Army in it, Task Force Talent and Consortium. So U.S. Army had a bunch of like different units, while Task Force Talent had very, very small amount of units, but they were more versatile, i.e. they could handle more situations uh, than the U.S. Army. Consortium was basically a mix of low-cost stuff and terrorism. In that scenario, you have something that's, uh, you know, reflecting real life. They actually did because, um, you know, if you think about this, right, these technologies for the most part exist. So here's a real life example implicated into a game, and it was a lot of fun. One last example, XCOM Enemy Unknown. I preferred this game over XCOM 2 because they had a bunch of mechanics or other crap going on that I just absolutely hate it. One example being hacking, but that's a, that's a completely different discussion. So in XCOM Enemy Unknown, at the end of the game, you were using alien weapons. I was very sad to see that because I think they had the potential to incorporate um, units that specialized in earth weaponry and perhaps create a earth weaponry uh, research tree. I think that that could have been done, but unfortunately they didn't do it. And so when XCOM 2 rolled around with the stealth mechanic, it was very hard to make use of the stealth mechanic because you didn't have suppressors or any of that. So there's a, there's a scenario where an improvement could be made. These others did perfectly fine, uh, the other examples, but this one I think could have used some improvement. Now don't get me wrong, this was a great game and I enjoyed it still, but I'm just saying that even the best of the best could still use improvement. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about future usage and examples. This is where you can make a story. We're going to start with the Barrette XM109 as this brings into the discussion of tactics and decisions behind um, some of the more specialized areas of a military. This is going to be more or less anti-vehicle, not anti-tank portion of the military. Um, the MA2, as most know it, as the 50 BMG rifle, uh, is currently in use to destroy Toyota trucks. That's what the enemy is currently using in the battlefield is Toyota trucks with uh, machine guns mounted on the top. The 50 BMG can punch right through uh, those trucks with little difficulty. The entire goal of that scenario is to just disable the truck. There's no way you're going to be able to 100% disintegrate, destroy, however you wish to word it. But you can disable and prevent it from being used against your allies. The XM109 project is supposed to be uh, an upgrade from that. It's using a 25 by 59 millimeter round. For reference, the 50 BMG is 12.7 by, I think, is in 99? Well, I know 12.7 is the first number, and that one's correct. So if you notice that it's basically double a 50 BMG. This is going to mean a lot more recoil and a lot more weight in terms of the ammunition used and also the weapon itself. You'll even see that here. It says mass is 33.2 pounds. Now Wikipedia isn't 
always 100% accurate, but in this case they are. I've Googled this and it is 33.2 pounds. On face uh, value, you might not be thinking that that's a lot, but once you start adding things into the mix, that's when it becomes a problem. Your average infantry is going to be carrying between 60 to 80 pounds of stuff in their backpack. This includes MREs, batteries, ammunition, or other things. Then you add in the armor. Your military vest is probably going to be anywhere between 15 to 20 pounds, maybe, by the time you add all the stuff into it. And your helmet's going to weigh between 2 and 4 pounds. So think about that. You're adding 33.2 pounds to 60, 80 pound backpack plus whatever it is, 24 pounds of armor. You know, people are not Hercules, okay? This is too much weight to be putting on a person. If you are going to create a unit designed to take out Toyota trucks, Humvees, or things like that, I think that you're better off doing that with vehicles. So let's go back in history and look at some of that stuff. So here's a 17-pounder um, Achilles from World War II. The reason I pulled this up instead of the, I think it was M10 Wolverine, is because if you look at just the raw numbers, and we're not going to get into a big discussion of all the other stuff involved, but just the raw numbers, the 17-pounder was doing a phenomenal job of penetrating armor but for its time. It was doing a lot better than some of, our, uh, some of the U.S. rounds in World War II. So I think that they could create something like this again, where it's a lightly armored vehicle designed specifically to get to a point very quickly and fire rounds. Another close example would be the uh, M8 Greyhound. This would be another good way of doing it. Now the 17 pounder or 37 millimeter cannon might not be the best choice for that scenario. It might be better to use um, an auto cannon like the M242 Bushmaster or things like that. So as you can see right there, I just gave you a perfect example of how to think like the military and incorporate that into a story in a way that's educational. I kept it realistic while making it things a little bit fun and interesting, I would like to think. Because if you think about it, that's a faction you could create, is a faction that incorporates logistics, kind of like we had here with Act of War, where we had Task Force Town U.S. Army. You could create a faction that's unbiased from politics and uses the best things. That could be a thing in a game. Now that's just one example. Let's go ahead and look at some others. Um, because I think that this will also kind of help with education and things like that. So, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. military makes way too many decisions based on politics. If politics was free from the military, I think we'd be seeing much better usage of the money and time invested into testing um, and actually using them in the battlefield. In the infantry scenario, you have to be flexible towards defensive warfare, um, urban combat, clearing buildings, and all these other messes. General infantry is supposed to be designed to handle a wide range of tasks. For that reason, the 556 hasn't been the best for that. The 556 NATO struggles to wound targets at a distance. Now, up close, it's going to definitely shred somebody. It can do a fine job of that. But at a distance, you're going to find yourself in a better position if you're using something like the 6.5mm Creedmoor, which by the way is under testing by uh, US SOCOM. The other round that's under testing by the US military is the 6.8mm uh, round. The major advantage the 6.5 Creedmoor has is in velocity and uh, a few other factors. The 6.5mm Creedmoor has little to no issue with hitting targets at a distance with good accuracy. That's because the bullet doesn't drop very much over the course of its flight. It's not like the 7.62 NATO which drops pretty extreme at certain distances. 
So something like the six and a half creed more would be perfectly fine to a general infantry role. 6.8, we have yet to see more data from what I've been able to tell, but maybe the six and a half or 6.8 can do it just as well. These are the two rounds that I would say is worth the um, investment of time. Because um, the 6.5 military creed more doesn't have a military round yet. That's one thing that does make it very hard to determine what's best. Military rounds are usually designed for a very specific purpose, like the M855 for the 556 and things like that. They're all designed for a very specific purpose. But the 6.5 military creed more doesn't have any military rounds yet because there hasn't been a use for it in the military. Um, and even then, it takes a lot of usage before that happens. So while they could create the best 6.8 millimeter round and say, oh, it's better than 6.5 millimeter, millimeter Creedmoor, the problem is it's not a fair comparison because there's not a military round for the 6.5 millimeter Creedmoor. There you go. There's another stepping in the logic process in terms of how to do things. We just went over any vehicle. This is general infantry. Now let's talk about more specialized units um, in terms of like special forces or protection details, the people that are designed to protect diplomats and generals and things like that. In the scenario of protection detail, you want a very compact weapon because you're going to be in vehicles a good portion of your time. You will also be in buildings where there's going to be tight spaces. For that reason, you don't want a large weapon. For that reason, the U.S. military has been looking into the Ruger, or I'm sorry, Bruger and Thalmet uh, APC-9K, which is a 9mm submachine gun. In my opinion, based on the data available and just looking back at history, terrible idea. The reason it's a terrible idea is because, as I just was pointing out with General Infantry, you're going into a multitude of situations, and you're going to add in a whole other mess in comparison to general infantry. See, the problem with protection detail is your enemies are going to be a very big threat, right? You're talking about protecting people whose enemies have deep pockets. They're going to be hiring mercenaries. They're going to be throwing the latest technologies at you, right? And so a 9mm round, which is a pistol round, um, is not going to do a whole lot of damage to armor, especially military armor. That's why the 9mm pistol round does so well with the law enforcement communities. It's because in the law enforcement world, you're not really going to be finding that many armored people, or at least there's not going to be a high chance of it. But in the case of protection detail, where you're protecting diplomats and military generals, the chance for you to be up against ex-military, current military, or even mercenaries is going to be extremely high. If that person, whether it be a diplomat or general, has done something to piss off the wrong person, I can guarantee you they will throw everything they have at it. In that scenario, you absolutely must have a weapon capable of responding to not only just all the different scenarios that come with protection detail, but also one that's ready to deal with the problem in terms of them having armor or them actually using military tactics against you. So in the military tactics, they're going to be behind cover, walls, or things like that. The 5.56 NATO rifle round uh, does have barricade rounds, i.e. they're designed to punch through uh, thin walls. They're not going to punch through brick and mortar or things like that, but they can punch through thin walls like drywall and things like that while still maintaining enough of a velocity to have a chance to go through the person's armor as well. The reason that that is a big deal is because the chance of you getting injured or killed doing frontal combat with somebody that's either equal in training or greater training than you, um, that's going to be pretty high of chances of injury or death. You don't want to risk it. So you want to use every advantage you have, right? That means firing 5.56 five, uh, NATO rounds through the wall blindly. Yes, it's not going to be very accurate, but if you can get six or eight rounds in before he pops back out of before your enemy pops back out of cover, there's a chance that one of those six to eight rounds is going to hit them, and they're going to realize that it was a bad idea being behind that wall. 
So there you go, that's protection detail. Now let's cover a scenario related to that, but also going to teach you something about uh, sound noise, well, sound or noises. So in most games, you'll have um, suppressors on weapons, and they do make it quieter, but I don't think that it's accurate. When it comes to real-life scenario uh, type of stuff, what really changes the noise level of the firearm is the round it's using. This is a classic example right here, 300 AEC Blackout. Um, there are, of course, other subsonic rounds, but this is one of the few subsonic rifle rounds. Now, 300 AEC Blackout is, in the subsonic variant is really, really quiet. Now, it has a wide range of, not, of ammunition, so subsonic isn't the only one that's available to it, but if you do use subsonic, it's going to be very quiet with the suppressor. Um, if I remember the numbers right, uh, they were. I read somewhere that a 300 AEC Blackout SIG MCX Rattler with suppressor on using 300 Blackout is 24 decibels of noise. Compare that to a 1911, which I'm sure y'all are familiar with from World War II games, Call of Duty, and some other ones. A 1911 can produce as much as 110 decibels of noise. So think about that. A pistol caliber producing 110 decibels of noise, while a rifle round is producing 24 decibels. That goes to show you where the difference is. The uh, great thing about lower noise weapons is, well, for starters, you won't be hurting your ears as much, but um, it also helps in combat scenarios where if you have to put a whole bunch of rounds down range, it's going to make it very hard to listen to what's going on around you. Now, there's been developments in headset technologies that kind of help with this, but at the end of the day, it's just going to be a lot easier if you can hear what's going on. Because if you're focused on that person down range, well, your enemy, and you don't hear what's going on behind you, there's a chance somebody come up and kill you. So something like this helps because it reduces how much noise is being made uh, while you're firing, so you have more awareness. Now this is um, the reason I was bringing up um, protection detail a moment ago when I was going into the discussion of this is because this actually is another good round for that. If they really want to go 9mm, this would have far more penetration. Although 5.56 NATO uh, would be a far better alternative, at least until more military rounds are made for 300 Blackout, um, I think that this has potential for that. But, um, yeah, so you can see that I've gone through uh, different scenarios, their uses, and different things that can be done. At the end of the day, games can take advantage of all these different decisions and thought processes to to not only create a better story but be educational as well you have to realize that there are a lot of countries where the average civilian does not get to use a firearm as a matter of fact when i went to an event and i won't say which one it was because i don't want people connecting the dots in terms of my information and things like that but um i went to this event it was an international event and just outside of the event was the gun range. Now, this gun range had no deals with the event or anything. This was just something that they did completely on their own. They had a PUBG day. And they invited anybody who went to the event to come into their uh, guns range and look at all the weapons in the game PUBG. It was a widely well-loved um, aspect of their trip when they went to this event. I saw tons of posts about how I wish they would do this again. It was super educational, and it was really cool to pick up the weapons that are in this game. But unfortunately, the companies haven't done that again, or at least gun ranges haven't as well. So you have to keep in mind that there are people who are curious and want to learn, um, but they just don't have the freedom to do that in their countries. 
So keep that in mind when you're making games and stories about all this different stuff. Especially if you're going to be making a game that's either historic or it's um, trying to replicate real life. So like I made the example of Call of Duty Modern Warfare, is they shouldn't have had SMGs or shotguns in the game. It should have been carbines, assault rifles, uh, DMRs, snipers, and things like that. But yeah, that's really all I have on the subject. I hope that this was interesting to you and that perhaps one day you'll ask that companies, game companies do better. Thanks for listening.